Well, an interesting show today. We're going to talk about pot, politics, and art. What do the three have in common? Well, State Senator Tick Segerbloom. Now, I talk uh, the pot thing, because you've been in the paper a lot about medical marijuana. But what a lot of people don't know is some of your background. Um, your mother was a, uh, a very, very famous uh, legislator, Jean, right? That's right. Your dad was an incredibly uh, famous artist. And, uh, and then out of that, parenthood produces... The pothead. <laughs> not a pothead, <laughs> but, but anyway, state senator. But you know, I was curious, what kind of influence did, um, did your dad have, for instance? I mean, do you have any artistic ability? Yeah, I really don't, and, and uh, my sister does, so that's kind of a genetic thing. Uh -huh. But um, I think he gave me uh, an appreciation of Nevada. They both they both did. You know, my mother was a third generation Nevada, and they used to go around the state, and and he would photograph and and, and paint things that uh, all around the state. Which so I, I really do love Nevada. Is your dad better known as a a, a paint an artist or a photographer? I, th I think ultimately he'll be better known as a as a watercolorist. Uh -huh. he, he was a really multidimensional. He came uh, to Nevada from, from California, went to UNR, met my mother there, and then came down here and, and actually, as a working position, he, he um, got a job as a photographer on the dam when the dam was f first being completed. And he didn't know anything about photography, but because he was an artist, he said, hand him a camera and said, you know, start taking pictures. So that's what, when I was growing up, he, that's how he made his living. But he always mm -hmm. was an artist on the side. Then he taught, you know, for, um, Art at, at UNL, LV, and and um, but you know I think just the the pictures, the paintings he did, but a lot of pictures too that he took of old Nevada, which is gone, or, right. uh, always live on. Well, a lot of them are in museums, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and you have a lot in your home. I do. Yeah. Yeah, my house is kind of like a museum. <laughs> Art museum. <laughs> and what about uh, his cameras? You, you you know, a lot of people collect those, uh, you know, older cameras, and you know, there's nothing like them today. Yeah, we, we um, I think we gave those to the State Museum, uh -huh. but um, um, but he did have a lot of great things. He was a big Rolleiflex person, but he also had a big camera like Ansel Adams and a lot of big negatives that he took back in the 50s that are very famous. And then we gave all those negatives to the State Museum. And, and your mom at the time, your dad's busy, you know, doing the, what is it, the left, left brain stuff, and, right. and your mom was, uh, you know, a state legislator for a lot of years. That must have been an influence. I mean, you went to law school. I mean, it was, you know, part of what she did, being involved in the law. Well, actually, she didn't become in the legislature until after I came home. Okay. And, and um, so when I was growing up, she was a teacher. She taught um, government in Boulder City. And, and uh, so that's why my political background was really from her just, just um, teaching government. And we always talked about government around the table. Um, so I followed that from walking for Adley Stevenson in the 50s to, and then of course I went to college in the 60s, so became kind of, I wouldn't say revolutionized, but at least politicized um, with the Vietnam War. And then, um, but she actually was on the city council in Boulder City first, and then I got active in the Democratic Party, but state chairman, and we were looking for somebody to run for the legislature in Boulder City. Mm -hmm. And it's a Republican district, but because everyone there knew her because she had taught them all, she ran as a Democrat and won, and she was served. Uh, and then she became very famous in her own right, as you said. Yeah, and, and of course, this happened to her like later in life. She I mean, ran at 75 yeah. years old when she ran for the legislature. Yeah, amazing. I, I'll and be she had incredible energy. Yeah, yeah I'll be turned out by the by the age <laughs> that she first started. So it's kind of embarrassing. Oh, I don't know. Those genes probably traveled down. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. Well, I meant turned out as far as my ability to run for office. Uh -huh. But maybe at 75, I can find something better to do. And and your wife is also, you know, peripherally involved in a lot of political things. She's worked for the mayor, she's worked for the city, she's worked for different um, um, committees and, uh, right, in, in the Ab city? Absolutely. County. Yeah, she uh, started, first helped Jan Jones get elected, so she worked all the way through with Jan and then, mm -hmm. then worked for Mayor Goodman, too. So, uh, no, she's been very politically active and, um, you know, she's done more, really, in her job with the city than, than I've ever accomplished as far as just changing things and, and improving the lives of people. And you've been, you know, really active in a lot of causes um, as a private attorney, you know, with the influence of your family, and at the same time, you know, recently as um, as a legislator. And it seems like you're becoming known, you know, based on this medical marijuana thing. It's going to be on but my tombstone. It's going to be. <laughs> here, here lies uh, uh, Tick. Uh, he, 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 everybody else turned on what he turned down. Right? Exactly. <laughs> um, but how did that all happen? I mean, because be 
prior, we did have a medical marijuana law, correct? Right. Well, the voters actually put in the Constitution in 2000 the right to have marijuana for medical purposes. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, and in that constitutional amendment, it says the legislature shall make it available. But the legislature was never able to get enough votes to actually pass a mechanism where you could actually get the marijuana. So um, prior to now, you could grow it, but you couldn't buy it from anyone. Um, and so it was basically a, a constitutional law which had no remedy, so you, you couldn't really get it. And now, for the first time, we'll actually have a mechanism where you can go to a dispensary, purchase it, uh, the marijuana that's been grown, that's been certified, that's been tested. Uh, you'll know exactly how much is there. So it'll be very similar to a medicine. I mean, the science of that has really developed. I mean, as you're, you're starting to say, right. the way they can test it to put, you know, the, 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 the percentage and degrees of the contents of, of each crop and the, uh, I guess, the intensity of it, huh? Absolutely. They actually have electronic machines. So after you, they, they have grow houses where they grow it, and then it goes to one of these testing labs, and they will actually measure how much THC is in a certain amount. And then so when you go purchase it at the, you buy it by the ounce or, or a smaller portion, a quarter ounce, but it'll tell you how much THC is in whatever you're buying that's been electronically certified. It'll also search out for um, adverse chemicals or pesticides or anything, make sure that none of that's there. So it's, it's really, our product will be guaranteed. You don't have to worry about it. Now, look, when you buy liquor, for instance, it will give you a percentage of alcohol and 12% you know, or whatever the number is. And is there a maximum for those kind of intensities with alcohol or with pot? I, I don't know. I've, I've been told that, that the current pot um, has a higher percentage than what that I used to use or, or experience, and I don't know if you, you, you back inhaled, in the 60s. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm not sure if there's right. a ma I think there's, I don't know what the maximum could be. But at least you will know, and hopefully, if you're somebody who uses a medicine, you will be able to gauge how much you need and, and be able to quantify that as when you purchase it. And that's the beauty of it. Right. And since you mentioned the 60s, <laughs> uh, we have, courtesy of uh, Kristen, our producer, a, uh, here's a Life magazine cover from 1969, marijuana. At least 12 million Americans have now tried it. Are penalties too severe? Should it be legalized? You know, and what has changed since 1969 is unbelievable. But you know, at, at that time, the emphasis was on um, the criminal justice system. There was very little conversation about the medicinal um, uses of marijuana, correct? Absolutely. At the time, it was, it was something you did for fun. It was like alcohol, but no one ever, at least I never heard anyone talk about, oh, this is going to gonna cure uh, back pain or, mm -hmm. or glaucoma or insomnia or any of you know, the things that we talk about today. Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, because a lot of this falls, in, I, I see it, in, into two camps. There's the first camp that thinks, well, hey, it's, you know, it's not that difficult, not that dangerous a drug, you know, it should be legal, alcohol is legal, alcohol is, you know, more dangerous. Uh, alcohol is by far is drugs. much worse. Yeah. Prescription drugs, I mean, the, the, the social consequences from those drugs are much more severe than anything that marijuana does. Yeah. And, and, and the other camp is, wow, there's medicinal, you know, advantages to marijuana for cancer patients, for um, um, people with uh, Crohn's disease, for other ailments, glaucoma, for pain, yeah. for glaucoma, for chronic pain, for stomach disorders, um, it, and it seems that it really works. Absolutely, and that's what I've been shocked about during this process is, is the number of things that marijuana is used for, and the people who've actually come up to me and said, you know, I was on Oxycontin, a very addictive, basically, um, heroin, and, and I was able to get off of it by using marijuana. It's like, wow. If you can do that, that, that's pretty impressive. So is that what's, you know, how the tide changed? That what swung the tide, uh, that people started looking at this uh, for medical purposes instead of just, uh, you know, entertainment purposes? Well, I, that, that's currently what's, what's involved in our bill today mm -hmm. because that's how it was passed in the Constitution. But I also think, um, kind of under the radar, all along since the 60s, it has been used recreationally by mostly younger people. But uh, even people that like myself who grew up in the 60s and who never stopped using it. And, and at some point, there just became a, a critical mass of people who just said, wait a minute, why are we having to buy this illegally, facing criminal penalties, creating a mafia with people that out there, criminals who are creating it and then selling it to us? 
uh, all these terrible things, people going to jail, having felonies on the record for something which actually isn't that bad. And, and Nevada had one of the strictest laws in when, the country. When I was going to college in the, in the 60s, when you would drive to California on the state line, there was a billboard that said, warning, life imprisonment for having possession of marijuana. Amazing. Right, right I mean, where the, you know, the, where whiskey pizza is now. It, right. I mean, it's, it's just amazing how, um, but, but at the same time, it was like one of those things where kind of everybody looked, looked the other way and we did it and no one bothered it. And then after the 60s, it, then people really started enforcing it. And, and lots of people's lives have been destroyed by, by possession and, and convictions of felonies. But the, the reality is that, that it's just not that bad. So, I mean, if you have over 50% of the people saying we ought to legalize it, you cannot also at the same time be putting people in prison for that, in my opinion. I mean, is that the way government should work? That it, it, you know, 50 percent of the population, the majority of the population, wants to legalize a particular item, whatever it is, then the, should the legislators um, approve that and legalize it? I think so, or at least study it. I mean, one of the things that's crazy about it, this is all federal law that, that's, that's, that's so bad. It's, it's a Schedule One under federal law, which is like heroin. But but the federal law also says you, the government can't even study to see if it is if it should be like heroin. But, but I don't know about you, but, but I know personally that it's not like heroin. It's not, I mean, again, I would not encourage anyone to, to use drugs, any kind, but if you kind of talk about drugs and alcohol, then marijuana in that range is not that bad. It's certainly not something that should be criminalized. Now, it's been um, legalized in places like Amsterdam for quite a while. Is, what is, what is that? result then? I mean, is there a greater drug problem, a lesser drug problem, greater crime, lesser crime? I mean, how does it affect places like Amsterdam? Um, I, I'm not sure about Amsterdam, but, but I can tell you just in Colorado and Washington and in California. California, even though it's been medical since, I think, 97, it's basically been legalized because, you, as you know, you can go out and there's a doctor mm -hmm. sitting out in front of the store and you say, what's your problem? Oh, I got a headache. He'll write you a prescription. You walk in and buy the marijuana. Right. There's been no increase in, in juveniles using it. Uh, there's been no problems associated with, with additional marijuana use. And in fact, just the opposite, uh, the, the crime rate's gone down, they've decriminalized it. So a lot of uh, things that, that um, the bad parts that, that used to happen are no longer happening. But by the way, is that doctor doing anything wrong? If somebody comes in and says, hey, I have a, a headache, and a doctor feels that a matter, marijuana prescription in California would, would you know, be helpful for the patient, is there anything wrong with that? Well, personally, I don't think so. Um, yeah. The reality is that, that if they're a qualified doctor, now, um, how do you know if you have a headache or not? I mean, ultimately, it's all based on symptoms that the patient's telling you. Right. And if you believe that this is going to help somebody, then that, that's what you're a doctor for. You're there to help people. Yeah, I mean, it's no different than somebody goes to a physician, hey, I can't sleep, and they get a, some sleeping medication. Yeah, I mean, Xanax or, or Prozac, I mean, these right. things are given away like candy, and somehow or other that's great, but yet you give a prescription for a marijuana, and all of a sudden that's a crime? That, that's not right. Do you see... Um eventually, um, uh, well, let's talk about in Nevada, that Nevada would be similar to what's going on in Amsterdam, that it would be legalized here eventually, and they'll have, but it, like in Amsterdam, they have uh, what they call coffee houses or coffee shops or something where you go in, you can purchase uh, the pot, and you can either get it to go, or you can, <laughs> or I guess you can smoke it there, um, but you can't walk around the streets, I don't think, and smoke it. Yeah, I, I, I've never been to Amsterdam, so yeah. I can't say for that, but I, I do feel that um, particularly if we can show after the medical marijuana bill is fully implemented and we have dispensaries and grow houses and it's all tightly controlled and regulated and taxed so we show that there's a profit to be made for the government that if we can show that that works then the population is ready to go ahead and, and fully legalize it tax it for schools make sure that it, it again it doesn't go you have to be 18 or 21 to buy it it doesn't go out the back door to kids uh, I think that's going to happen it's just the public sentiment is there now, essentially, the law um, enables uh, licensing uh, licensing measures for different kinds of entities. Uh, one, you talked about a grow house. Uh, a grow house is, I guess, what it sounds. It's a place where their facility, indoor or outdoor, it doesn't matter. It well, that's one of the, actually, yeah. we're getting into the weeds here, but um, one of the questions right now is whether you're allowed to grow it outdoors or it has to be a fully enclosed 
building. Mm -hmm. um, most places uh, like Colorado or Washington is fully enclosed, but that's probably because they don't have the sunshine we have. Right. So in my opinion, as long as you had a wall around it so you couldn't get out outside, why not take advantage of the sun, cut the cost as far as these things are using tremendous amount of energy with the grow lights and stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, but either way, it's, it's a tightly controlled, it, it, it's, it, they have a, down to a science, they have people that are just not specialized in growing the stuff. Um, they have, they'll have like 12 rooms because it takes 12 weeks to go from the basic um, little plant until it's budded. And each, 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 so each room will come to bud uh, every week. So then they, they go down the row and they, it's, 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 it's very, it's, it's just a production. But it's, it's um, very scientific, they have to be very careful of how they do it. Um, but but it's it's and it's a lot of jobs too, which is yeah. very cool. And and that's why it's so different today than it was in the '60s. In those days, people just what they threw a seed into the soil and and eventually some sprouted and some didn't, right? Right. And and you know I'm, I'm an expert, but supposedly the male plant uh, doesn't have anything the female right. plant does, but the two get together. That's a problem. So it, it's. You know, it's it's complicated, but it's not something that's it's insurmountable. And these places, in, in, again, and in, in even in Arizona now, they are they've got sophisticated people that all want to all want to come to Las Vegas. That's the cool thing is that our law has been designed to be for profit. It, we, we want the best and the brightest from around the country to come here and set up their establishments. We're going to be tightly regulated, but uh, we're going to have the best people here um, with the best marijuana. For the best price, um, if you have the medical marijuana card. Yeah, and the nuance of it, and my hat goes off to you legislators that thought of this, is unlike California, if you have a medical marijuana license, that license is only good in California. It's my understanding that under the Nevada law, if somebody has a license in a different state, then as tourists, they can come to Las Vegas. You know, right? I mean, this is right. hey, we're we're so good at. at uh, at, uh, at uh, facilitating uh, getting money from our tourists, that they can come to Las Vegas and actually use the card from a different state to purchase the medical marijuana in Nevada. Right. We're the only state that has that, what's called reciprocity, where if you show your card from Arizona or California uh, at one of our dispensaries, you'll be able to purchase marijuana here. And we feel that that's going to be a real boon as far as, again, revenue to the state. Yeah, I mean, it was, hopefully that. I mean, it sounds to me like a, a genius idea. I mean, I can, are you going to see billboards in California? <laughs> hey, you know, come to uh, Las Vegas. We have the best pot. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, <laughs> we don't want them in Nevada, but um, I'm sure there'll be ways that you can get out and, and uh, yeah. be on, online and stuff. But um, you know, it, it's it's it, it is so interesting to see how all these major players in California are all want to come to Nevada. And of course we have a limited number here, so they're, they're all be fighting for these, mm -hmm. these dispensary licenses, but it's, it's very exciting. And of course at some level the federal government is cooperating with that concept because you're not allowed, correct me if I'm wrong, to bring pot from California to Nevada. You can't really cross the state lines. You can't get it on an airplane with, uh, with marijuana. That's all still against the law. Right. So even if you have um, you're a medical marijuana patient in California, and you're coming to Las Vegas for the weekend. You can't bring your pot with you, right? You'd have to come and purchase it here. That, that's the theory. Yeah. And and the other thing is you can't do is you can't grow it in California and bring it over here and sell it. So it's so that's that's one of the strange things about it because of the federal law. Everything has to be within the state, which again is going to create lots of jobs because we have to duplicate all this here, and they can't just um, bring it here and sell it. Yeah, it, it, just amazing. Let's talk about some of the uh, the you know. The positive things that uh, that we're studying that we have determined that marijuana helps. We've talked about glaucoma and some of these illnesses, uh, particularly for people uh, with taking chemotherapy that have you know very nauseous uh, side effects from that. For some reason, um, certain strands of, uh, of medical marijuana help with the digestive system, with uh, the stomach pains, with the nauseousness, with the, the eyesight, with glaucoma, with, with pain. Um, it, it, how long have we known that? Well, actually, there's the scene that goes back you know, to early man, to Egypt and things, where they've, they, they've actually found it um, buried with, with people whose bodies have been preserved. But um, you know, the thing is, we've never been able to study it because the federal government won't allow it. So the, why it works, we don't know, but the, but it's clear that it works, 
And, and the more things they look at, the more it helps. And there's actually, I didn't even realize this until I got involved, is there's actually two different strains. One type does one thing, one type does the other thing. Now, if you saw that on 60 Minutes a couple weeks ago, they had a story about a young girl in, in Colorado who had the kind of a, um, a epileptic kind yeah. of thing, mm -hmm. but, but no, no drug would work. And yet the, the marijuana strain that they developed for her uh, would actually... Uh, got rid of all her, her shaking and everything, and, and she's on the road to rehabilitation, which is just phenomenal. Yeah, what I see happening now, you have people really developing specific strains that may help alleviate specific ailments of medical conditions. Right. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's just amazing. I mean, I guess you can't say, I mean, Scotch doesn't do that, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but, but yeah. the other thing is, it's, um, you know, one of our, in our bill, one of the criteria for getting a license is that you have some kind of medical consultation and uh, we're hoping that we'll have specialists who will say, okay, what do you, what's your problem? If that's the problem, try this right over here. If you can't sleep, try this. So they'll actually have different varieties and then people who can give advice um, like a pharmacist might or like mm -hmm. a doctor might. I mean, this is really great for people who are not well. Um, and it, you know, but it, the whole thing to me, uh, Senator, seems like a little bit of a game that we're all playing. You know, it's like, okay, we'll, we'll legalize it for medical marijuana, but we're don't want to really take that next step in legalizing it totally like, like Colorado and the state of Washington has done. Now, I guess in our next legislature, are you or somebody, you are introducing a bill to legalize it? Well, here's what I understand is going to happen. Okay. Um, there, there are going to be people out there with signatures, getting ready to get signatures. And in Nevada, uh, right after the election, which will be next, next November, if you get a certain number of signatures on the signed for a law. There will be a proposed law to legalize it. And they'll get those signatures uh, collected. And then it comes to the legislature, which when we meet in 2015, mm -hmm. we have, I think, 60 days to, to vote on that bill to either vote for it or against it. If we vote against it, then it will be on the ballot in 2016 for full legalization. Uh, so that that's that's my understanding of where things are going to go. Mm -hmm. And I would be happy to to propose my own bill, but the reality is I think we need a couple of years to get the medical marijuana uh, process going and be able to show people that it does work. Because part mm -hmm. of this is the revenues. We want to make sure that, that if you grow something that we, we, we can have figured out how much it is, we can tax it, and there's revenue produced. Because right. if we could do that, it's like a win-win. Alcohol produces, is a major producer of revenues for the state. If marijuana could add $100 million for schools, how great would that be? And, and how does that leave law enforcement? I mean, I would think that, you know, privately a lot of cops would be in favor of it. It's like, hey, we don't want to be bothered, you know, with, you know, with this issue of law enforcement. But by the same token, you have people who are con legitimately concerned about, you know, being high and driving. Well, you're right. But first off, the bill that we, we did, which is being implemented now, the police came came on board. They support it because actually it clarified a lot of the problems they've had. Mm -hmm. Some judges have thrown out uh, arrests and, and prosecutions because the law is so unclear and the fact that the legislature never did anything. So they like the law. But but the second issue you talked about, which is driving under the influence, that's the one we really have to address because mm -hmm. the current standard is basically if there's anything in your bloodstream, but the, the research shows that things can be in your bloodstream for 30 days. Right. So there's no correlation between the bloodstream and, and being under the influence. And we have to figure out some mechanism to show that you're under the influence as opposed to you, know, you had a puff uh, three days ago. Now in alcohol, they can gauge how much uh, blood alcohol you yeah, have those, and that's what period based of time on, it's been there. Yeah, yeah, it's based on tests and, and we know mm -hmm. based on history what, what's going on there. But, but with marijuana, we have basically, if there's anything in your bloodstream right now and you're in an accident, you can be arrested for DUI. Right. And that's really tragic because there, there's no correlation uh, and, and you can't expect people who are taking this for medicine not to drive their car. But that's currently the way it is. You, you, if, you, if you were using it and you're driving, then you're running the risk of being convicted of DUI. And what is the status now? We have um, the other part we haven't spoken about, <coughs> excuse me, are the dispensaries, the retail shops where you'd go and purchase this. There is a limit of, what, 40 dispensaries in southern Nevada? For Clark County, yes. For Clark County. And... Uh, and then I guess the city and the county have to figure out what the zoning requirements and the licensing requirements will be for that. Right. Uh, the state actually gives out the 40, but then each local entity can decide whether they want to have them or not have them. And if they do, where they want to put them, what kind of restrictions they want to have for them. And that's currently going on right now where 
um, the county and the city and are all looking at, at, at the types of usage. Uh, we paired our law after Arizona, so some of the, the uh, people that run the agencies have gone to Arizona to see how they do it, to get a better feel for what we're looking at. Because we put some design criteria and stuff in there, but it's 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 a complicated process. I'd never realized starting an industry from scratch how much is involved, but but particularly because of the regulation. So it's like we took a casino industry and didn't have it, and all of a sudden now you got it. Um, I hear rumors that some of the you know some big companies are interested in coming into Nevada. I mean, pharmaceutical industry or alcohol or is that or I, tobacco or I, is yeah, that just I, uh, I haven't rumors. heard any of the, of the big industries, yeah. but but a lot of the big players uh -huh. and and frankly a lot of really big business people in, in Southern Nevada have approached me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know if it's just the intrigue of doing it or the thought of making money or just they're at the age where they want to make, be productive, but, but you would not believe the prominent Las Vegas names that have called mm -hmm. me and said, we want to do this. Right, and uh, and you know an amazing thing. How many we have like 16 states or something like that that have legalized? I think uh, it's up to 23 now as far as some, some level. Some level, which is more than half our country's population, because you're talking about states like California, which have right. what you know, tens of millions of people, right? Forty million. Forty million. So, so you have all those potential people, uh, customers, coming into Nevada. They're going to come here, uh, be another reason to come, spend money, pay taxes, and um, and light up, I guess. Yeah, medical yeah. marijuana yeah. tourism. It, they all, yeah. it's, it's it's the future. It's the future. Right next to our, our medical tourism with the Cleveland Clinic and some of the other <laughs> things that we're trying to do. I mean, it's, this is all part of uh, part and parcel of you know the holistic uh, direction of medicine, I guess. Right, but I mean, here's a state and a city that says, "Come here, do whatever you want to do. Stay, what stays here, ha what happens here stays here." We basically people think you can already do it anyway, right? Right. Um, we have a state that legalized prostitution, gambling, uh, and yet you can come here and smoke a joint and and, and you go to prison. And who was it? Was it Britney Spears or one of, one of the, uh, you know, some movie star was driving down the strip with a joint and, and ended up going to jail. It's yeah. like ridiculous. Yeah. Well, it's changed a lot since 1969, but I could tell you, I, from personal experience with people that I know that use it medicinally, it has changed their lives. Changed their lives. They've gotten off uh, pain medicines. They've gotten off terrible drugs, and, and uh, it's been a godsend for a lot of people. So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Senator Tick Segerblum. And hey, we'll see how this all works out. I'm sure it's going to work out well. See you next week. Thank you. Be sure to visit us online for more information about today's guests. To see past shows or even contacting us about being on the show, simply go to the edbernsteinshow.com. That's the edbernsteinshow.com.